it's time for Northwestern Outdoors Radio, the award-winning show that covers fishing, hunting, and all sorts of outdoor recreation here in the great Northwest. Northwestern Outdoors is brought to you every week by Max Lure Company, a legacy of innovation since 1969, by Loophole Optics, America's optical authority, by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors, by Wallawa County, nature is on display in Northeast Oregon, and by The Real News, your fishing resource. Also by Shiloh Inns and Suites, providing you with affordable excellence. And by Mardon Resort, the place for fishing, hunting, and more in eastern Washington. And now, it's time to head outside with your host, John Cruz. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I love September. I got a chance to get in some fall camping at Minam and Wallawa Lake State Parks in northeastern Oregon with Georgia my young Springer Spaniel pup, and while I was at it, I managed to cast for trout in the streams and the lake there as well. I also rented a kayak at the marina at Wallawa Lake State Park and spent a glorious afternoon paddling the waters of this beautiful lake where the sun was shining, the water was calm, and the temperature was just right. Throw in a little hiking and wildlife watching, and you'd forget the main reason I went there was to attend the annual Hell's Canyon Mule Days Festival that took place last weekend at the fairgrounds and Enterprise. Now, I know I sound a little hoarse this week, and there's a good reason for that. My little Springer Spaniel pup ran away at a campground I was stopping at to let her do her business. She saw a deer, and she ran off into the woods, and I'll tell you what, I was scared. I lost her for an hour at a place that neither one of us had been before. Fortunately, I found her none the worse for wear, and she was on the leash the rest of the trip, but my voice is paying the price for a whole lot of yelling looking for that dog. Getting back to Hell's Canyon Mule Days, this festival is a whole bunch of fun, especially if you like mules and enjoy cowboy culture. We'll be talking to a few folks there to include Sandra Lozier, the president who organizes this event every year, and a bunch of different vendors that are really interesting, covering everything from saddlery to mule art to even old world oxen. In addition to talking to a bunch of people about Hell's Canyon Mule Days, we'll also be talking to Jim Hutton with Oregon State Parks about fall camping in eastern Oregon. There are some fantastic destinations you ought to visit right now while the weather is great and the crowds are diminished. We've also got some interesting outdoor news out of Idaho and Montana covering an upcoming bison hunt and information about wolverines. Throw in a field report with Brad Snook from the Sportsman's Corral and Joseph that covers fall fishing and fall hunting in northeast Oregon and I think you're going to enjoy our stay in this part of the Beaver State. In addition to this, we've got another new Extended Max Minute with you with Lance Murs that covers a lure that will catch both salmon and pike and muskie. And we've got information about several upcoming events, too, to include the upcoming Atomic Salmon Derby. It's taking place later this week in the Tri-Cities. Tony Nelson, one of the event organizers, will be telling you all about that. But... Before we get any further into the show, David Sparks has another edition of Sportsman Spotlight for you, brought to you every week by Shiloh and Suites, the hotel that lives up to its motto of affordable excellence. The hunter becomes the hunted. David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. This is my public service announcement for all you sportsmen out there who are looking forward to going bird hunting with your beloved dog. Be careful. Here's why. Fish and Game spokesman Evan O'Neill tells us about a German short-haired pointer. We got a call. A gentleman had let his German short hair pointer out early in the morning before daylight. wasn't outside very long when he heard the dog yelp, and then it came charging back through the dog door into the house. He could tell, obviously, it was distraught. Flipped the light on to illuminate the backyard and saw the lion crouched on his back porch. Obviously, had been pursuing the dog back to the house, and the dog disappeared through the dog door, and I'm sure the lion didn't know what to make of that. He watched it for just a few moments, and then the lion turned and went around the corner of the house and disappeared. The dog had a single injury. It looked like maybe the cat hooked the dog with one front claw and made a very clean five or six inch vertical incision along the rib cage. So the gentleman got his dog into the vet and got him patched up, and it looks like the dog is going to be fine. Is this typical of 
maybe a young lion looking for an easy meal? Yeah, that's what we suspect. We've seen enough of these kind of things where it's turned out to be a young lion involved that that's probably the case here. It's a young animal that's still learning how to hunt and having difficulty perhaps finding food and compared to deer or other wild prey, a domestic dog or domestic cat is pretty easy pickings. This is David Sparks for Sportsman Spotlight. Confused by so many national brand hotel reward programs, blackout dates, expiration dates, different points for different hotel rewards, and gimmicks? At Shiloh Inn Suites Hotels, it's simple. No blackout dates for any rewards stay. If we have a room available, it's yours. Hi, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. As a rewards member, you'll receive free room upgrades, a dedicated personal agent to help book your stay, points that don't expire, points that can be used for free nights at any one of our beautiful hotels or donations to your local school or free airline tickets and much more and as a special bonus you'll earn 100 free bonus points just for signing up from your very first stay you receive free wi-fi free breakfast at most locations the kids stay free we don't charge ridiculous resort or parking fees and we're dog friendly shiloh inns affordable excellence american owned and proud of it Wetlands are some of the most important ecosystems on Earth. But our wetlands are quickly disappearing. Find out how you can help. Join Ducks Unlimited today. You're back with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. September is here. October is around the corner. The crowds are gone from the campgrounds. And personally, I think this is the best time of year to go camping. The weather is still fantastic. There's lots to do. And with us here to tell us more about places to go in eastern Oregon is Jim Hutton with Oregon State Parks. Jim, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Jim, let's talk a little bit about fall camping you know what are some of the things that appeal to you about this well it seems like every everybody and everything just takes a big deep breath you know over here there's a lot of agriculture Mm -hmm. with farming and ranching and the and people have their crops in by and large by now and the big heavy rush of the summer is over with and things just kind of take a breath and and it's a lot more comfortable in the parks right now. It really is. You know, again, like I said just a few seconds ago, generally speaking, the weather this time of year is fantastic. Not too hot, not too cold. Still lots of sunny days out there. You get to see a lot more wildlife. Those migrations are starting, especially for the birds. And it's a great time to go fishing and hunting's kicking off too. Yeah, the wildlife viewing is really great right now because the young ones are old enough to follow the parents around. You see turkey, deer, elk, willow lake. You'll see kokanee spawning in the river. There's a a lot of activity that's happening around that is different than the summer. And with the lack of people, with the crowds diminishing a little bit, and the wildlife feel a little more comfortable and they get out and you can find them a little easier. Well, what I thought we'd do during the next few minutes is actually kind of break down uh, some of your favorite destinations in terms of state parks in eastern Oregon that people might want to visit during the next few weeks. And let's start off with Wallowa Lake State Park. That's where I'm staying this weekend. It's probably one of my favorite state parks ever because it just has so much for the outdoors enthusiast. And the interesting thing about Wallowa Lake is one of those that so many people can't get in during the summer because it's full so that they wait till right after uh, Labor Day. And then oftentimes it'll be pretty busy even through September, but it's a wonderful place up there. And those, the cool nights are coming now. So if it's 80 during the day, it'll be, you know, 50, 60 at night. And it's just, it's real nice to have that cool evenings for sleeping. Oh, absolutely. I agree. And folks, this is a big park and you have lots of options here. There's lots of RV sites, lots of places to pitch a tent. They've got a few yurts. Another thing I like, it's right on this beautiful lake. Folks, if you haven't been to Wallowa Lake before, it's just drop-dead gorgeous, about five miles long. And you've got a marina there, too, which I thought is pretty impressive. But I understand that's closing, isn't it? The marina does close September 15th, um, uh, usually right around the middle of September every year. This year, it happens to be September 15th. That's a private concessionaire that operates that. They've been with us for many years and do a great job up there. But again, folks, Wallowa Lake State Park, wonderful place. you got the river that flows right by it into the lake. You can go ahead and use the boat launch 
much there even after the marina is closed and there's really good fishing in Wallawa Lake for both kokanee and rainbow trout and lots of wildlife to see lots of hiking to do as well in that immediate area and it always seems that there's lots of deer wandering through that state park too. There are a lot of deer there you know a lot of that is because they know it's safe from predators and they come down and and we've got several nice bucks that have been hanging around there this year and uh, it's always fun to see them. We know there are a lot of people that visit the park that are from the Portland area or from other urban areas and it's neat for them to be able to to see some of the wildlife up close. So we've got Willowa Lake State Park. Let's go ahead and talk about a few other places that you would send people to this time of year. Uh, What's another one that comes to mind? Well, Lake Owyhee is kind of a little-known treasure in the department and in the state of Oregon. And if you haven't been out there, it's a really large canyon that, you know, it's a Bureau of Reclamation project for irrigation. That's how all that farmland is irrigated there. And it's a huge lake. We have a floating restroom that's several miles upstream. And even though the water levels are extremely low this year, the rock formations around the lake are really pretty. And then this year, with the low water levels, you're seeing some rock formations that you don't see the rest of the time. And a lot of the business there is for people that are fishing, and so there's less use right now also. So it's not near as hot as it is during the summertime. You're getting those cool evenings. And the morning and night when the sun starts, either when it's coming up or setting, casts shadows around those rock formations around the lake, and it's just beautiful to just watch everything change as you sit and watch it. And folks, this is a wonderful state park. I've been there myself for a few days camping. It's right there on the lake. There's a boat launch nearby. Funny thing about this place is the reservoir actually offers very good fishing for both bass and crappie and the river right below the dam is very well known as a premier rainbow and brown trout destination for fly anglers in particular. But the funny thing about this park, it's an Oregon State Park, but I saw more Idaho plates there than Oregon plates by far when I visited. Yes, it's It's so close to, to Idaho that they can bop over there real fast and, and it's a long drive from, you know, from our population centers, but from Boise, it's an easy trip over there. And so you do see a lot of Idaho users. And folks, well worth the drive. I would highly recommend it. And those red rock formations, like you said, absolutely gorgeous. So we've got something there on the Idaho-Oregon border. We've got something up in the northeast tip. Where else would you send folks to? Some of the primitive camps that are here in the around the Lagrand, uh, between Lagrand, Pendleton, and South, we have several small campgrounds like Catherine Creek, Red Bridge, Ukiah Dale. They're just small little 20-site campgrounds, primitive campgrounds that have running water in the restrooms, but they're really like a step back in time. you got a nice little creek or river running right through them, and we have a restriction on the hours that you can use generators so that they stay really quiet, and it, it's really just like camping the way camping used to be. So if you want to get away from all the big giant mar- RVs that are packed in real close, it's really a neat variation in the camping. I love those sort of campgrounds. And usually those are forest service campgrounds if you want that experience. Another one that's up in, in that, that neck of the woods is Minam State Park, which also is kind of rustic, has the vault toilets there, and it's right on the river. And I, I'm thinking of stopping there tomorrow for a little bit of fishing on the way out of town. Those parks are really neat, and the difference between them and a Forest Service park is that we have running water at them so that it, you know, it makes it just a little bit nicer for not having to pack so much drinking water or for washing your hands and things like that. And it's it's a good in-between because the Forest Service is very primitive, our developed campgrounds are very developed, and then this is a good in-between where it's still irrigated lawns, still mowed, still nice, but just not quite as catering to the to the big rigs. Folks, you're listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We're talking with Jim Hutton with Oregon State Parks about some Eastern Oregon fall camping destinations. We're almost out of time, Jim, but I want to talk about one more place. It's not camping in the traditional sense, but there's a lot of outdoor recreation in the area. French Glen. Tell our listeners about French Glen. Well, French Glen is a historic hotel, is the state park facility that's there. We have two similar facilities. The other's over at Wolf Creek Tavern, which was a stagecoach stop uh, that's over on I-5 just north of Grants Pass. But French Glen is a, a really neat, again, like a step back in time. You're staying in an old historic hotel. It's on the state or the National Historic Register, and it's right there by the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. So many, many people go there to take advantage of the migration. I know the first time I went there, I was seeing birds. I didn't even know they existed in the United States, but they just they, it's a very unique environment down there. And there's a lot of other things to do. There's the crater. There's a tour where you can go around and look at these craters. There's 
hot springs. There's just a variety of things to do if you use French Glen as your as your base of operation. Absolutely. And don't forget the Steen Mountain Loop. If you want to drive that, it's absolutely wonderful views, jaw-dropping to say the least. And you're close to the Hart Mountain Antelope Refuge as well. We are out of time, but before we go, Jim, let's go ahead and give folks a website where they can find out more about visiting Oregon State Parks in Eastern Oregon this fall. It's uh, Oregon State Parks. Org. Really simple, folks. That's OregonStateParks.org. OregonStateParks.org. They do a fantastic job of sharing the outdoors with people like you who listen to this show. Go ahead and check out the website, make a reservation, or make plans to go camping right now. Jim, thanks for telling us all about this on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thank you. You demand quality performance from your binoculars, whether you use them in the field, on the water, or at a stadium. But you don't want to spend a fortune. That's where the BX McKenzie binoculars from Leupold come in. These armored, waterproof binoculars are both comfortable and dependable. Look for your McKenzie binoculars at quality sporting goods retailers near you. BX McKenzie bringing your world into sharper focus only from Leupold. Yeah, you, the guide, outfitter, or outdoors business owner who's listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Have you ever thought of becoming a sponsor of our show? We've got local sponsor opportunities at all 50 of the stations that carry Northwestern Outdoors every week, and we've got some network opportunities too. If the outdoors is your business, we can help you with your advertising needs. Contact me, John Cruz, through our website at northwesternoutdoors.com. That's northwesternoutdoors.com, helping you get the word out about your outdoors company. We're back with John Cruz on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. It's time for another Max Minute. Fish on! Brought to you every week by Max Lure Company. This week, we're going to tell you about a lure that you've heard about before, and we've talked about this lure in the context of catching salmon. But it's also a fantastic lure if you're going after musky in places like, oh, I don't know, Curlew Lake in eastern Washington, or maybe pike in places like Lake Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. With us here to tell us more about this versatile lure, Lance Murs with Max Lure Company. Lance, what is this lure that's catching both salmon and muskie and pike? John, it's called the, the Max Lure Sledgehammer. And the cool thing about this is that they're made specifically for those musky pike. It's got a 150 pound cable test line. So those fish that have those very sharp teeth are not going to get out of that mouth. That's nice to hear. Cause I remember the first time I went pike fishing, I was losing a whole lot of fish cause I didn't have a steel leader. And, and they'll just kind of gnaw right through that line in a hurry. Why don't you describe the sledgehammer for our listeners? Well, it comes with our patented flashlight blade, which is similar to the smile blade. It's got a six inch squid body and comes in eight different colors. But the cool thing about this is that the body cavity inside is sendable chamber. And it also comes with a five aught hook. So it's very, very stout lure that's going to catch a lot of big fish. So again, the flashlight blade, think of it as a really big mylar smile blade, spins at slow speeds, gives a lot of flash. And tell me more about the scent chamber inside the hoochie body. Well, inside it's a, there's got a buoyant inner float tube that you can tip any type of scent that you want into that. So it's going to keep that set a lot longer and it's going to attract more fish because of it. Boy, I could see this being great. Like I said, not just for the salmon, but also, like you said, for the pike and the muskie as well. Go ahead and check it out. It's the Sledgehammer. It's from Max Lure Company, meeting both your freshwater and saltwater needs for big fish. Find out more about this and other Max Lure products at maxlure.com. I'm Bob Loomis and I fish for walleye. Sometimes when I'm out on the water, I feel like a destroyer captain hunting for targets with my electronics. I'm not hunting submarines though, I'm hunting fish. And when I find that big one on the fish finder, I want to make sure she's going to bite. That's where the Smile Blade Slow Death Rig from Max Lure comes in. The Smile Blade spins and flashes at ultra slow speeds, and the one of a kind red hook keeps that bait moving in a way the fish can't resist. It's the Smile Blade Slow Death Rig. You're the destroyer, this is your depth charge. Only from Max Lure. It's a great time to go fishing, and whether you're heading to the lake for trout, to the saltwater for salmon, or fishing the Columbia for Chinook or Steelhead, The Real News has got you covered. The columnists at The Real News are just like you, die-hard anglers. Better still, they share their expertise to help you have a great time on the water. The Real News has been going strong for 26 years and prides itself on being Washington's only sport fishing newspaper. Look for your copy at local sporting goods retailers or subscribe online at therealnews.com. 
From the Columbia River to Puget Sound, the Coastal Conservation Association in the Pacific Northwest works to conserve the fish we love and does so while protecting our heritage of sport fishing. To find out more, go to ccapnw.org. Again, that's ccapnw.org. Next up on Northwestern Outdoors Radio, we're at Hell's Canyon Mule Days. We're at the fairgrounds in Enterprise, Oregon. This is really a different sort of event that celebrates all things related to mules and cowboy culture. With us here to tell us more is the president of Hell's Canyon Mule Days, Sandra Lozier. Sandra, tell our listeners a little bit more about this. We are a great three-day family event. We have everything from quilt shows to Dutch oven cook-offs to pit barbecue, cowboy poetry, and a wonderful three days of mule shows. A mule show is kind of like a combination of a rodeo and a horse show. So we have halter and showmanship type classes, but then we also do barrels and roping and mule races. So it's a combination of a lot of things. Really fun for spectators to watch. Well, there's been a whole bunch here today watching the different events going on, and you're right, all sorts of different events that I've never seen before. It's a ton of fun, and and there's a real following for mules, isn't there? And I guess we really ought to back up, because some of our listeners believe it or not, don't know what a mule is. Why don't we start with that? A combination of a horse and a donkey is what creates the mule. And the mule is the one animal that could be extinct tomorrow and still be bred back within a short period of time. Well, I suppose you're right. And mules, I understand, are are actually preferred by a lot of outfitters over horses. Why is that? You know, a mule is a very uh, cautious animal. A lot of people think they're stubborn, but they're really just very cautious. And so you're not going to be able to get them to do something that they don't feel is safe to do. And a lot of people that ride mules, they really enjoy mules. They, you know, over a horse. And of course, as far as pack strings and everything, mules have been for history, you know, with pack strings. And Wallowa County certainly has a lot of tradition with mules. Most all of our area of Hell's Canyon was settled with mules. And then, of course, a lot with the Forest Service up in the High Lakes in the wilderness area. Depends a great deal on mules. So this event happens the weekend after Labor Day every year, doesn't it? Yes, this is our 34th year. Started in 1981, and it has just continued to grow every year. So folks, you missed this year's, but you've got to make plans to come next year. And again, ton of fun. You're going to see all sorts of meals, but there's parades, there's cowboy poetry, there's food vendors, there's all sorts of saddle and tack that you can buy here as well. Just a ton of stuff to see and do in a really fun setting. Thanks for telling us all about it. We're going to go visit some of the vendors now and find out more about Hell's Canyon Mule Days. Thank you for being here. All right. You heard Sandra talk about Hell's Canyon Mule Days, and there's a whole bunch of vendors here, and there's a whole bunch of mules. Now, if you're going to ride a mule, you're going to need a saddle. And one of the vendors that's got a whole bunch of saddles out here is Hickman Saddlery out of Post Falls, Idaho. With us here to talk more about saddles and saddles for mules, Clay Inslee. Clay, do you make saddles yourself? Yes, sir, I do. And and tell me about some of these saddles out here. I see both used saddles and brand new saddles. Is is there a market for used saddles as well as new ones? Oh, sure. Yeah, just like used cars and whatnot. We take them in on trade. We sell them on consignment, and some we buy outright. What should somebody look for if if they want to buy a saddle and they're looking for a good quality saddle? What are some some things that people definitely want to look for and things people want to stay away from? Very first thing you want to check is make sure the tree is sound in the saddle. And the best way to do that is stand the saddle up on end, stand it on its horn, and push pressure down on the uh, cantle, back of the seat. And if it gives, then you've got a bad tree, and there's no sense even going any farther from there. Great advice. Something else that caught my eye here. There's a difference between a horse saddle and a mule saddle, which I didn't know until I walked up here. Tell our listeners about that. Traditionally, if you look at a mule from the side and look at his backbone line, you'll see that it's flatter than a horse. A horse has curve. So the tree has to be made to shape not curved, otherwise it'll rock on a mule, and of course then you cause some problems. If you watch out here in the arena and watch uh, people riding around on the mules, if you see the back of the saddle humping up like maybe it's a cold morning, they've put a horse saddle on a 
mule back. That's the interesting thing about this show, folks. We're always learning new things. They've got some beautiful saddles here and a lot of good quality used saddles, too. If you want to find out more, check out their website. It's hickmansaddlery.net. That's hickmansaddlery.net. Or stop by their store in Post Falls, Idaho. Clay, thanks for telling us all about it on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right, we continue to explore Hell's Canyon Mule Days at the Wallowa County Fairgrounds in Northeast Oregon, and we ran across something really different here, mule art of all things. We've run across an illustrator named Bonnie Shields, and, well, you draw some beautiful mules. Well, thank you. I consider myself the world's leading half-ass artist. (laughs) Well said. Tell me a little bit about your art. I've been doing this, well, I ran into the mule in the early 70s in Tennessee, where I'm kind of originally from, if you can't tell. And actually, me and the mule have never been the same since. I claim I got kicked in the heart. Well, you ended up in Sandpoint, Idaho, and I understand something you've collaborated on is a very... Here at Hell's Canyon Mule Days is not just about mules. We're talking to Bull Whacking Cass. She's got a couple of oxen here, and Cass, I'll admit, I've never seen an ox before. These things are huge. How big are they? Well, they're at least six feet tall. Saul weighs 3,300 pounds, and Job will, he's 17, and he will weigh about 3,100 pounds. Incredible. Your farm is Old World Oxen Farm. You specialize in living history of the 1800s. You've got an old wagon here. Tell me about what you're doing here with these oxen. Well, primarily we're here to teach the school kids in the area how life was on the Oregon Trail and California Trail. And we teach them how to cook over the campfire. It's a hot fire. We we let them uh, brush the oxen so they can see how big they actually get. And they do laundry. They build tents. They make... Uh, jerky, sizzle eggs on the campfire, do pancakes, and just basically play. Love it. Let's talk about the oxen themselves, because I think a lot of people just figure that the immigrants used horses, and that's not true. The oxen was the main beast of burden that pulled those wagons along all of these immigrant trails, weren't they? Exactly. Well, the reason they used the ox was they were cheaper to buy than the horses, and the primary reason was that they didn't need any uh, specific high-quality hay or grain. They can eat, you know, scrub brush, they love sagebrush, and they'll eat the native grasses. Now, you're here at Hell's Canyon Mule Days. I understand that over Labor Day weekend every year, you're also down in Baker City at the National Historic Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, too. Right. Yes, exactly. It's just a great show. And at that show, people... Uh, When I'm standing in front of the uh, span of oxen in front of my wagon, the freighter's wagon, uh, they'll come out from the museum where they have the uh, stuffed oxen pulling the immigrant's wagon, and they'll come up to mine and they go, oh my, don't they look real? (laughs) (laughs) Well, folks, they are real. And if you want to see these huge, incredible animals, make it a point next year to head down to Baker City over Labor Day and stop by the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center or the weekend after that at Hell's Canyon Mule Day. Cass, thanks for telling us all about this on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Hope to see the people. Yeah, they need to know about the history and the historic animals that pulled the immigrants' wagons west. Amen. The road is calling you to experience one of Oregon's seven wonders, the Wallawas. So grab your family and spend some time exploring Northeast Oregon's Wallawa County. Visit the State Park at the head of Glacier Carved Wallawa Lake. Travel the Hills Canyon Scenic Byway. Feel the pioneer spirit. Nez Perce history and see our western arts and bronzes. Ascend to the top of Mount Howard on the tram and you'll see why Wallowa County is one of Oregon's most scenic and adventurous vacation wonders. This summer, take the road that leads to wonders. It begins at WallowaCountyChamber.com. You demand quality performance from your binoculars, whether you use them in the field, on the water, or at a stadium. But you don't want to spend a fortune. That's where the BX McKenzie binoculars from Leupold come in. These armored, waterproof binoculars are both comfortable and dependable. Look for your McKenzie binoculars at quality sporting goods retailers near you to include your Cabela's, Sportsman's Warehouse, or Northwest Bymart stores. BX McKenzie bringing your world into sharper focus only from Leupold. 
Ah, the great outdoors. I'm ready for a great weekend of camping at this remote campground. But first, I think I'll invite my camp neighbors over for a meal of fire-roasted hot dogs and baked beans. dum de dum dum de dum Hi, neighbors. I just came over to... Pizza! Uh, hey, is that pizza you're eating? How did you get pizza out in the middle of nowhere? Pizza! Thanks. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is delicious. A pizza oven operated on a propane canister and another on the top of your camp stove? And they're both made by Camp Chef? I know Camp Chef made great stuff for outdoors cooking, but this? I've got to get one of these pizza ovens from Camp Chef. No more beans and weenies for this guy. From now on, it's artisan pizza for me when I'm camping. Pizza! The Camp Chef Pizza Oven. Bake your own artisan masterpiece on your back patio or at the campground. Find out more at your local sporting goods dealer or at CampChef.com. Pheasants Forever is working hard every day to ensure there's more wildlife habitat for the future. To join us, go to PheasantsForever.org. In the Navin Root Motor and Minn Kota Troller, in the Low Rance Fish Finder or two. We push off the dock just before 5 o'clock and go sailing off into the blue. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. It's time again for news and reports from the field, brought to you every week by Mardon Resort at Eastern Washington's Potholes Reservoir. They've had a great summer of fishing there, whether it be perch and crappie from the dock, bass or walleye from the reservoir, and big trout too, along with some great, great catches of huge catfish and you know what the fishing's only going to get better especially for bass and walleye as we get into september and october find out more about fishing here at potholes reservoir and the surrounding lakes and hunting too by going to mardonresort.com that's mardonresort.com where the fish bite but we don't we start off our outdoor news with an announcement from yellowstone national park that 900 bison will be removed from the park primarily through hunting in the months ahead according to the outdoor hub the large cull of bison is necessary because the animals are doing too well within the sanctuary offered by the park and they are crowding out other species like elk for food and habitat. Although most of the animals will be taken by hunters, some will be sent to slaughter on behalf of local Native American tribes and others will be transported to the Stevens Creek facility for research purposes. Switching from bison to wolverines, Fish and Game Directors from Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming have co-authored a letter to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about that agency's decision to not put wolverines on the endangered species list. The directors support this decision, noting wolverines are at their highest population level in nearly 100 years and their numbers continue to increase, a factor that supports state management of this species. They also take issue with a controversial topic where the animals were nearly listed as endangered due to projected climate change over the next 40 to 80 years and applaud the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for not caving into this and instead making, in their words, the right decision for wolverines for the right reasons. And in Washington, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has been doing some updates to their Fishing Washington webpage that anglers are going to like. They already had good info on their lowland lakes, but in the last month, they have rolled out a whole bunch of new information on saltwater fishing and also a new section about fishing the high lakes in the Evergreen State's Cascade Mountains. You'll find not only tips on where to go, but also information and videos to help you have success when you get there. Go to the WDFW website at W wdfw.wa.gov or simply google fish washington and you'll find it in a hurry and with that it's time to head back to wallawa county in northeast oregon our next field reports coming at you from joseph oregon we're broadcasting from the sports corral we're talking to owner brad snook about fishing and hunting in wallawa county in september and october brad Beautiful weather this time of year. When it comes to fishing, mid-September, late September, into October, you know, where are you sending people for success? September-wise, uh, Wallowa Lake for trout is holding up uh, real good right now. It's a little early for steelhead, although we've heard of a couple in our rivers. Rivers are a little low and the water temperature is high, uh, so a little rain and uh, steelhead will come right up the rivers as well. So when we're talking about the rivers, are we talking about the Grand Ronde and the Wallowa, or are we talking some other streams as well? 
Grand Round fed by the Wallawa and then the Imnaha River on our east side. When do you expect those rivers to start heating up for these summer steelhead that average around six pounds? Well, we figure the first of October, some earlier, but October on, then uh, fall fishing gets real good for the steelhead. During this early fall fishing. Are people tossing spinners and casting flies, or are they fishing jigs under bobbers? What are they doing to get the steelhead? They do both. A lot of jig fishing under the bobber. Fly fishermen definitely like the lower waters, but a little cooler water would be nice. And getting back to Wallawa Lake, beautiful lake, folks, if you haven't fished it before. It's mainly known for kokanee, but I know in the last couple years that the trout fishing has been doing really well. How big are those rainbow trout these days, and and what's a good way to catch them this time of year? Bait uh, fish Fisherman, probably the most, although a cast master, quarter ounce cast master, silver with orange stripe, has been very well liked, and uh, customers have stopped and said thank you and taken some of those home with them as well. As a matter of fact, I'll probably be buying one before I leave here, Brad. Let's go ahead and turn our attention to hunting. How are things looking for the big game season this year? Big game season, we're going to hope for the best, of course. The elk are talking in the eagle caps to the uh, archers right now already. Ready, which seems early. The north end of the county, people are seeing elk, but it seems uh, quieter for the archers. It's too early, and the season started early, kind of on the rut season. What do you expect for deer hunters this year? Deer look like we have lots in the valley, but uh, out in the forest, deer numbers are a little marginal, I'd say. Interesting, and, and you're right. I've been seeing tons of deer in the valley, and of course, everyone just assumes if you see them in the valley, it's going to be good out there. So, nice dose of reality there. Northeast Oregon, great place to recreate whether you want to fish or whether you want to hunt and the place to get outfitted is the sports corral in joseph it's right on the main drag they're open six days a week monday through saturday drop on in and get all the gear you need to go ahead and have a great time in the field brad thanks for telling us all about it on northwestern outdoors thank you john with musky spinners and lures oh honey i love you and that's not a lie musky guides all tell the truth this must be the reason why i miss fishing more than i miss The road is calling you to experience one of Oregon's seven wonders, the Wallawas. So grab your camping equipment and fishing gear and head out to northeast Oregon where you'll find the views are endless, the air crisp and clean, and the waters cold and clear. Set up camp by the shores of Wallawa Lake or in the heart of the Wallawa Whitman National Forest. Take your fishing gear and cast your bait into the deep waters of Wallawa Lake or roll your fly into one of the eddies of the many freestone creeks and rivers teeming with fish. This summer, take the road that leads to wonders. It begins at WallawaCountyChamber.com. Good hunters know before you take that shot, you've got to see the whole picture. Now, the best way to do that is with a spotting scope, binoculars, or a rifle scope, but it's got to be from Loophole. Now, Loophole is a Northwest company with a reputation that stretches across the world for making superior optics. Look for Loophole optics at your local Cabela store, Dick's Sporting Goods, or online at Loophole.com. Loophole, America's optical authority. The off-season is a great season to visit Mardon Resort. Located in eastern Washington's Columbia Basin, you'll find incredible bird hunting, great wildlife watching opportunities, and fantastic fishing in a boat or right off the marina docks at Mardon Resort. Better still, off-season deals save you money when you bring your RV or stay in the hotel or wonderful park cottages. To find out more, log on to MardonResort.com. Mardon Resort, where the outdoor fun lasts all year long. It's a great time to go fishing, and whether you're heading to the lake for trout, to the salt water for salmon, or fishing the Columbia for Chinook or Steelhead, The Real News has got you covered. The columnists at The Real News are just like you, die-hard anglers. Better still, they share their expertise to help you have a great time on the water. Look for your copy at local sporting goods retailers or subscribe online at therealnews.com. We're back with one last cast from John Cruz on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. It's time for upcoming events, and we're starting off by telling you about the Atomic Salmon Derby. It's taking place September 19th through the 21st near the Tri-Cities in South Central Washington. With us here to tell us more about this very popular fishing derby is one of the organizers, Tony Nelson. Tony, give our listeners the basics about the Atomic Salmon Derby. Well, the, the basics of the Atomic Salmon Derby is, is this is a great, great sportsman event. 
that uh, this will be our fourth year running this event, and we've seen increases in guys in participating every year. And I'll tell you what, it gets better and better every year. And actually, you know, with the last last year being a record salmon run and this year being a record salmon run, it's just been a great culminating event for guys. And it's it's also a culmination of the end of summer. So, I mean, it's an event that just, for us, is, is really impactful to the end of summer. And it's also a really good vehicle for us to focus on uh, a charity. This year, we've moved to Salmon in the Classroom. Uh, obviously, you can tell Salmon Derby, that's a great charity for us to choose because it's something that's really near and dear to our heart. And so, I mean, the, the Derby is something that, you know, over the last number of years, I think everybody's kind of really enjoyed. And this year, we've added a couple new features that I think people are going to actually like a little bit more. So, Tony, let me ask you a question here. The Atomic Salmon Derby, are you basically fishing your choice of the Snake River or the Columbia River on the, the Tri-Cities? What are the boundaries? The boundaries are pretty much any waters located in, in eastern Washington. It's one of those kind of things that if you can make it there and get back to the weigh-in, we consider that to be the legal waters. Now, if you think you can make it all the way down to the mouth of the Columbia and fish there and make it back before it's time for weigh-in, that's okay. We can do that. We've kind of opened it up to that to a pretty broad array because that way it kind of allows everybody to participate. So we may have some folks that live down into the Oregon area that want to participate, gives them the opportunity to do that. We may have some guys up in the Wenatchee area which have participate in this event every year. It gives them the opportunity to fish in their area. So we've tried to expand it to as many people that want to participate in this, they can't. Uh, as long as there's salmon in their area and they can find a way to make it to one of our weigh-ins. Love it. Now, folks, Griggs is a big sponsor of the Atomic Salmon Derby. They're also a local sponsor of our show on 610 KONA airing in the Tri-Cities. So there's going to be some good prize money involved with this. And I understand there's a team challenge, too, where even more money can be won. Another sponsor this year is Lamaglass. That's right, those great rod makers out of Woodland, Washington. And for your $60 entry fee, you're going to be a winner right away. You're going to get a fillet knife and you're going to get a $79 certificate good for a Lamaglass Redline model rod. What's it going to take, Tony, to be basically in the winner's circle? How big was the big fish last year? Our biggest fish last year was uh, was in the upper 30s. And uh, historically, it's it's between the mid-30s to up to 50 pounds. The first year that we ran this, we had a 50-pound fish in there. And on average... It's right around in their mid-30s to 50 pounds. It's going to take a big salmon to win this one, but if you think you can do it, you're going to want to go ahead and enter the Atomic Salmon Derby taking place this coming weekend. That's September 19th through the 21st. Go ahead and find out more by logging on to AtomicSalmonDerby.com. That's AtomicSalmonDerby.com. You can also pick up tickets for the Derby at Griggs in Pasco. they got a great selection of sporting goods there as well, so you can get all the gear you need to compete. Tony, thanks for telling us all about this on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thank you very, very much. Another upcoming event is an ongoing one that takes place the third Saturday of every month in Whitehall, Montana. It's an NRA basic pistol shooting clinic offered by Fish Creek Ventures. It's one thing to own a pistol. It's another thing to know how to safely handle and use it. This 10-hour course will cover all of that and will get you a lot more confident and comfortable with that firearm in the process. Find out more at fishcreekventures.com. Shoshone, Idaho is the place to be this coming Thursday night, the 18th through Sunday afternoon for the annual Lost in Lava Cowboy Gathering. There's going to be cowboy and cowgirl poetry as well as musical entertainment every night at the Lincoln County Fairgrounds. Find out more at lostinlavagathering.weebly.com. That's lost in the letter N, lavagathering.weebly.com. And heading back to Wallowa County, Oregon, you may have missed Hell's Canyon Mule Days this year, but you can still attend Alpenfest in this area, known by many as the Swiss Alps of the Northwest. Alpenfest kicks off Thursday the 25th in Enterprise, and then moves to Joseph and Wallowa Lake for Friday and Saturday. You can definitely count on accordions, polka music, and the sight of men in lederhosen that weekend. Learn more about this beautiful place in northeast Oregon that's earned its name of the Swiss Alps at OregonAlpenfest.blogspot.com. 
northwesternoutdoors.com. Speaking of websites, I hope you'll check out ours at northwesternoutdoors.com. You'll find links to find out more information about our guests, previews of the upcoming show, and in case you missed last week's show, well, we've got it there for you too. That's northwesternoutdoors.com. And don't forget to like us and follow us on our Facebook page at Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We're always posting information and news there that doesn't make it necessarily onto our show because there's only so much you can cover in an hour. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed our trip to the northeast portion of the Beaver State. We've said it before, and we mean it when we say it again. When it comes to natural beauty, the good Lord did it right when he created this part of the great northwest. Find out more about it at the Wallowa County Chamber website at wallowacountychamber.com. Fall is coming up quick, and the weather is still great for fun outside, whether you're fishing, hunting, camping, hiking, pedaling, paddling, or more. So until next time, take care, God bless, and make it a point to spend some time outdoors. Outdoors.